So the theme of book one of Aristotle's politics is that household rule is not the same as political rule. That the polis, although on the one hand develops out of the household in the village, is essentially different from a household, large or otherwise. See, Aristotle is concerned that some think the state or the, the political association is just a large family or a large tribe. And that would mean political rule would be like the rule of a father over children. Or worse, the rule of a despot over slaves. So it's important to understand these basic household relationships. To understand what their basis is, what mode of rule is involved, what their purpose is, what type it is. Basically, household relationships and rule ministers to life. It's generation and preservation, whereas the polis is for the good life. This deals with some fundamental questions of necessity versus freedom, or the private and the public. Again, political life having to do with what's public. Drawing on a sense of freedom. So we can set up four relationships which are not the same as political relationships. The four relationships are the master and slave, the husband and wife, the parent and child. Those are the three primary relationships between people. And then we could also talk about property, the relation of property to politics, because Aristotle will also say emphatically that political society is not about administering an economic system. Economics is part of the infrastructure, if you will, or material cause, but it's not the formality or specifying feature which makes a political society. Although, again, there's a modern tendency to identify politics with economics, or to think that politics is simply the best arrangement of economic relationships or maximizing economic productivity. We will need to look at Aristotle straight on here and remember that this is the writing of a fourth century BC Greek pagan. And so it has its rough edges and surely will not pass the test of the politically correct or what's politically true in terms of the affirmation of what is democratic justice. But I think if we are fair to Aristotle, we will appreciate the subtlety of his approach. I think we will also appreciate the different circumstances in which there were harsher conditions to understand why his description of some of these relationships may come out as they do. Let's start with the master-slave relationship. Aristotle, of course, observed as an empirical fact the phenomenon of slavery. Often this was the result of war or conquest or various other forms of domination by some over others. As a matter of fact, Aristotle will say that most slavery has the characteristic of what he calls conventional slavery or conventional justice. It's just happened this way by custom. But let's look at his precise definition because even if, again, the point here is not that Aristotle affirms slavery. He's very subtle about it. I think at the end of the day, he denies that there is such a thing as a natural slave or natural justice about slaves and that it is entirely conventional justice and therefore variable therefore possibly at odds with what is by nature 
But again, this may miss the point of Aristotle's achievement, which is to define and understand what is this relationship of slave to master in contradistinction to the political society. Aris Aquinas makes full use of this description because it is so clear and so powerful. So let's look and see. We find on pages 10 to 11 of our text in Aristotle's Politics, this is book one, chapter four. He says, a slave is one who is not his own man, but another's. A slave is one who is not his own man, but another's. The slave is not free. He belongs to someone else. So to articulate this idea, Aristotle explains he does not work for his own good, but for the good of another. So later Marx will use, and Hegel will use the term of alienation or exploitation. Aristotle does understand that's in the very definition of the slave, that they are alienated or belong to another. Secondly, a slave does not initiate action. That is, action as Aristotle defines it, as the result of deliberation and choice. But the slave is a passive, living instrument of someone else. So the slave lacks autonomy, is property of another. And third, the slave would have, having nothing of his own, would not be able to resist the absolute rule of his master. So, Aristotle calls this despotic rule. Despotic rule is precisely that mode of rule which is directive of others as instruments. It is harsh and it would expect no resistance. A good instrument will not resist. The basis for such a relationship, if there is one by nature, Aristotle says, is a distinction between body and mind. That is, if there is a natural master, it would be one of superior intelligence and rational planning. And if there is such a thing as a natural slave, Aristotle says it would be one who is not capable of deliberation, but has bodily strength. So again, if there is such a relationship, it would be for a common good in physical necessity or survival, that is, it would be good for such a person to be directed by another and good for the master to have instruments to carry on his purposeful activity. Now, this is a very complicated question, but my interpretation of Aristotle is that he says there are not such beings by nature. That is, he sets up the definition, but I think undercuts the Athenian and by the way, Spartan practice of slavery by showing the difficulties and inconsistencies with claiming it's by nature and not just by convention and showing other inconsistencies in the very idea of a slave. How does he do this? On page 13, book one, chapter five, Aristotle says there would be a natural slave if, he puts this in a conditional, if human beings differ as much from each other as the body differs from the soul or an animal from a man, and further he will say something like this, if there's a difference between one human being and another such that he's like the very God on a statue on the Parthenon, then he would be a natural master. Now, I think Aristotle is using some irony here. He's speaking to Athenian gentlemen. Perhaps he's not telling them as directly as he could about their false claims to superiority. But after speaking in book two, saying men are neither beasts nor gods, I think the thoughtful reader would see, well, no, humans don't differ from each other as much as a beast or a god. A second contradiction he sees is that the slave, 
if they have no reason, how can they have virtue? And if they have no virtue, how can they function well as slaves? In other words, it's impossible to deny the humanity of the slave. I think the same difficulty was faced by southern slaveholders in this country, that they had to acknowledge the humanity of the slave. Jefferson saw the contradiction. A last point would be Aristotle says, you know, part of the claim of slavery is that it would be in some way perpetual or it, we get this caste system. But Aristotle does say at the end of chapter 5 that there are slaves who have the bodies of free men and others who have a free man's soul. Nature's intentions are not always realized. I think the point of this, what he's saying is that the descendants of the masters are not always better than the descendants of the slaves and vice versa. Now again, it, this is a point of much controversy in interpreting Aristotle. But what's behind this issue of slavery? What's behind it is that the body brings along with it many necessities and the need to labor to keep it alive. In an old-fashioned economy, we now, compared to the old economies, we have technology and instruments which can eliminate labor, eliminate instrumentality. But I think Aristotle's basic idea that reason rules the body despotically and there's a need to deal with necessities of life and that the good life requires some amount of freedom from labor are still truths. It doesn't and obviously should not be realized in a political system with slaves. But the basic principles that Aristotle is affirming, I think, are correct. Finally, we could even say Aristotle says the natural slave may be the man who makes himself slavish. That is, the man who only is concerned about his body alone and has no concern for mind. Let's go to the next relationship. That is on husband and wife. Again, this one is very controversial and problematic, but he does say the barbarians, the non-Greeks, confuse slaves and wives, but the Greeks know that the wife is a free member of the household. But here is Aristotle's analysis that the relationship between the husband and wife should be a political relationship. And that will be an interesting phrase that he uses. He says they should be seen as equals, but here's the kicker the feminist would not like, but the man should rule as one permanently in office. So Aristotle does think husband and wife is more like a political relationship between free beings, but he thinks the male ought to rule, and by the way, rule through persuasion, not through despotic means. Rule through persuasion, and here is the controversial passage in Aristotle. He says he thinks men have stronger deliberation, and women have deliberation but it is weak. I think he also sees it as a question of soul and body, a, a sense that a woman is more tied to the body and the natural cycle and men having greater abstractive power. Again, these are things to explore in your study of philosophy of human nature. But I think the question for today is again a question of body. That is, generation of life does require a respect for motherhood and its necessities. It requires preservation of life and defense from physical harm. In these two roles, that is, of motherhood and defender, I think you do find a more natural appreciation of a role difference or a functional difference between the male and the female. So present issues about
ERA and women's liberation in many ways is premised upon being freed from nature. That is, contraception has allowed freedom from childbearing, and this is what makes that question of equality more of an urgent point. Or similarly on defense, has technology equalized physical strength? Women now serve in the military. The Marines are the only branch who still train them separately because they think there may be certain functions or missions that the men will be better able to handle. But if technology can equalize physical strength, such as in flying an airplane, perhaps this sharp difference will disappear. But I think one must see Aristotle is speaking from the point of view of nature. Finally, on parent and child, Yves Simon has a very elaborate and insightful description of the parent-child relationship in the first chapter of Philosophy of Democratic Government. I won't repeat it, but I will bring in some of his points. The parent-child relationship is what Yves Simon calls substitutional. That is, the parent must substitute their virtue, their reason and will for the child, because the child's reason and will are weak and incomplete. The parent must guide and educate the child to learn what is reasonable, to learn how to choose responsibly. The parent must employ punishment, but also natural affection. So as Yves Simon and Aristotle point out, parental authority is not only substitutional, but it aims at its own disappearance. Its purpose is for the good of the child. Its basis is that adults have mature reason and strong resolve. The child has immature reason and weak resolve. The type of rule would be kingly or royal rule. The, and and in, in politics, this would be called paternalism. Aristotle would agree, see, that political rule is neither despotic, it is not the rule in a marriage, nor is it paternal. But true political rule would be a unique thing. Yves Simon has some very interesting reflections on colonialism. Is it ever appropriate to exercise paternal rule if people are not ready for self-government? Or now in the 90s and into the next century here, we see the breakdown of states and ethnic cleansing, the breakdown of states which may require some kind of trusteeship or paternal intervention to end otherwise will face tyranny, anarchy, genocide. But again, as Simone points out, it must aim at its own disappearance. And the injustice of the colonial systems was that it was a permanent paternalism which often verged in the direction of despotic rule. I think another contemporary issue highlighting Aristotle's great insight is what has been called the generation gap, that the new is better, or there's nothing to learn, that children don't need authority, that passion is better than reason, and ultimately that the child should rule and not the parent. So the conclusion here of all of this is that pre-political relationships are based on nature, Aristotle thinks, because they relate to the body and its necessities and the influence on reason. Authority is not simply power or coercion, but the persuasion of reason over necessity. And even among these household relationships, there are different kinds of rule which should not be confused present rhetoric tends to look at all politics as the master-slave relationship and seeks to politicize the body. I think from Aristotle we can learn that, there, that the body has certain limits to full politicizing, that there must be the realm of the private, 
the realm of the non-political, which then will not be characterized by the political principles of equality, freedom, and so on. Finally, we can say Aristotle's teaching here is that the pre-political relationships are open to formation by the political. The political regime will influence household relationships. The political regime will make a determination on questions like despotism or slavery. The political regime will have an influence on how husband and wife treat each other. I think this can be learned Many insights can be learned from Tocqueville on the influence of democracy on the domestic manners of Americans. But at the end of the day, Aristotle's thought here is that the household strains towards the good life. That household rule is primarily concerned with free members and their goodness, that is, their habits and virtues, and that the Household, although it comes into existence for the sake of life, aims at the good life. So this would mean, I'll just make a brief point on the question of money making. Aristotle thinks it would be quite an inversion of values to make money making the point of one's life. Property, he says, is something pre-political. Ultimately, he says it's about equipment for the good life. It's for action. I won't go through Aristotle's primitive economic sketches here. I think they still have many concepts of great value, particularly his distinction between use value and exchange value. But I will leave that for a course in economics. I'd just like to say on money making, Aristotle says that money making should be aimed at action and it should not be unlimited. Unlimited acquisition, the principle of the capitalist society, Aristotle thinks will bring with it many moral ills. It's, if it's made an end in itself, he thinks this is a problem. First of all, he has in mind the story of King Midas. It's unnatural, he thinks, for someone to be devoted to money, whose value is an instrumental value. Midas could not live on his gold if it meant the gold would replace his wife and children, if the gold would replace the food he must eat. That has a powerful impact on Aristotle's view of economics. Most of all, though, he says unlimited acquisition would lead to a bad way of life, to live for acquiring money without any limit or pause, would be to fail to see the distinction between mere life and the good life. Those with excessive money, Aristotle observes, often seek excess in pleasures of the body. And greed is a moral vice, not a virtue. Again, the point being that the acquisition of property is limited by natural use and secondly by the good life. Economics arises out of needs of the body and is open to political determination. Now, I think the last thing I'd like to consider here is to go to Yves Simone's account of authority in chapter one of his book, Philosophy of Democratic Government. See, what Simone does in that chapter is a brilliant explanation of authority. Why authority is natural, why authority arises out of our very social political nature, and then he distinguishes paternal authority from political authority. So this will be our first breakthrough into the notion of politics. His argument basically is this, that authority is required, even on the assumption of mature and perfect adults. 
which is a big assumption. But he says, the problem with some modern accounts of authority is that it arises out of deficiency. It arises out of wickedness. Its only function is to restrain those who may harm others. And that in an ideal society, there would be no need for government. There are some very interesting footnotes in which he quotes Thomas Aquinas. I recommend them to you since they're not in your book with the selections from Aquinas. But the basic idea here is that even on the assumption of mature adults, we would need authority. Its essential function is to secure unity of action. Unity of action. If we are a community, if we do have a common good, if we do require unity of action to promote and protect the common good, then there must be unity of judgment. And Simone says, how can we secure unity of judgment, either by unanimity or by authority? He says, those are the two options. Unanimity, he says, is not possible. And it's not possible due to the fact, not of just disagreement over ill will, but he says it has to do with the very nature of prudence, and practical action that we're dealing with contingent matters in which there is not one set answer. Practical truth does require a true reasoning and right desire, but there is a certain obscurity of what ought to be done. Simone says even with great plentitude, with greater choice, all the more do we need authority to determine which course of action to take. Again, I recommend the reading to you. He goes through some very prosaic examples, but I think they make the point that for common action, there is required authority to make a determination for the common good. Now, the next question will be, who should that authority be? Who should make the decision for the common good? And that gets us properly to the question of politics. So we will turn next to book three of Aristotle's Ethics and see what is it that specifically makes political society different from the master-slave, the husband and wife, the parent-child, but is a unique kind of rule, a unique kind of association.